that the purpose of memory is to provide you with a map of what to do so that you can be secure where you are. And maybe more than that, so that you can be secure and, and gain advantage, you know. You, you, can, you can get what you need and want from the circumstance. That would be even better. But, you know, lots of times you'll just settle for nothing terrible happening. If you can add some additional gain to that, so much the better. You know, maybe you learn that nothing happens to you in the playground that's upsetting, or maybe you learn that it's a great place to make friends, and that's even better. And then part of exploring the playground would be going out to make friends, and hopefully your mother, in some sense, is somewhat hands-off about that so that you can bang yourself up against the world a bit and learn what you need to learn about how to negotiate friendships. Now, let's go back to this guy who's having the murderous fantasies. Now, he's humiliated in high school. So you ask yourself, why? Well, there's a pretty good literature on bullies, bullying, and generally, bullies poke at all sorts of people, and uh, they start with little pokes, and if they can get a response that's gratifying to their desire to shame, then they'll keep attacking. But they start off small, and not everybody gets bullied. Most people get bullied some when they're kids, but some people are targeted fairly frequently, and they're people who tend to react in the manner the bully wants. And Perhaps there are also people who don't defend themselves very well when the first pokes occur. You know, they, they don't have a quick word in response. They won't stand up for themselves. They retreat. Uh, they get over-emotional. So then you might ask yourself, well, why would that be? Well, if your mother is operating properly in the playground, She's there when you run back and you need her. She's not there behind you when you don't need her, making sure nothing bad happens to you. And, well, why? Well, because bad things are going to happen to you, and what you need to learn is how to deal with that on your own. That's the best protection your mother can provide in the final analysis, is to allow you to be challenged to build competence. And that takes a fair bit of forbearance on her part. Right? She has to be willing to let you go out there and make mistakes. I remember when my daughter was learning, we, I bought her these monkey bars. Climb up a ladder, cross a ladder, down a ladder. It was pretty high. It was about eight feet, I think. And she was about three. She was out in the backyard learning to climb up these monkey bars. It was really interesting to watch her. She'd lift her foot up, and lift it up a little higher, lift it up a little higher, and then she'd put her foot on the first rung, and put a little weight on it, and then repeat that. And then she'd go up to the first rung, and then she did that with the second rung. Like just trial and error, right? A little foray, a little foray, a little foray. Mastery, and then a little higher, and a little higher. She was, it was a fairly high monkey bar for such a little kid. But we were watching her, and she was doing a good job. We just let her be. And you know, maybe she falls off the monkey bars when she gets to the top and breaks her arm. And then, aren't you a terrible parent? And, and the answer to that is maybe. And, and maybe not, too. You know, because getting that line between protection and overprotection right, that's tough. So now I'll tell you a little story that you all know. So I'm sure most of you have seen the Disney film Sleeping Beauty. And uh, it's a very interesting film, very interesting story. So the way the story sets itself up at the beginning is there's a king and a queen, father and a mother, let's say, and they're older. They haven't had any kids. So they're older parents. And they really want a child because they're older parents, and they haven't had, been able to have any kids. And so, 
finally, they have a daughter. They call her Aurora. And uh, they're pretty thrilled about it, and the whole kingdom has a celebration, and it's christening day, and they invite everyone in the kingdom to come, except Maleficent, which is an interesting word because she's an evil queen, but Maleficent means malevolent, right? It's, she's not only that she's... It's not only that she's... Uh, She's Mother Nature eh? in, in the negative guise. She's the tragedy of life. That's another way of thinking about it. But she's also malevolent. So she's also betrayal and catastrophe and cruelty. And the king and queen don't invite her to the christening. And you think, well, no wonder. Do you really want something like that at your child's birthday party? Or your, the christening, let's say. And the answer is... If you don't want that there, then you're that. And that's a hell of a thing to realize. You know, because if you don't allow your child to encounter what's negative about the world in measured doses and even what's malevolent about the world, then they don't learn how to weave their way around that or to cope with it. Both of those are important. And then they're laid open to it, and then that's on you. And you're doing it because you don't want any of that in your child's life. You don't want any tragedy, you don't want any malevolence, which is why they don't invite her to the, the evil queen to the wedding. And then what happens later in the story? Well, Maleficent says she's going to either kill Sleeping Beauty and that's because people who aren't prepared are more likely to die. And, or it's modified in the story so that she'll only become unconscious. And what does that mean? Well, that's what happens you know, to people who can't cope with the catastrophe of the world is that they are tempted by unconsciousness. Maybe they want to sleep all the time. They want to avoid. They're afraid to confront anything. Right? They want to shrink back instead of advancing forward. And to advance forward in some sense is to advance forward with full consciousness and courage and to shrink back is to wish for unconsciousness and maybe even death. And so when Sleeping Beauty hits puberty, she falls in love instantly with some guy she meets in the forest, which is not really something to be recommended. And, and uh, she falls too hard and too fast for anyone who's sensible and then finds out that that's a love that's not meant to be. And she's so catastrophically destroyed by that that Maleficent is able to entice her into unconsciousness. And so, then she's asleep. And she's asleep because the world's too much for her. She wants to be asleep. You know, the rest of this story is about it's Prince Philip, the hero, who confronts Maleficent, who transforms herself into a dragon and attempts to destroy him. And he confronts her successfully and hacks his way through all the thorns that she's put around the castle and wakes Sleeping Beauty up. And you can think about that in a sort of cynical way that this poor unconscious girl needs the hero who's a man to save her from the catastrophe of nature and malevolence and tragedy. But you can also read it psychologically and you can say that it's the awakening of the spirit of the hero and the conscious willingness to advance in the face of tragedy and malevolence that's the proper antidote to the desire for unconsciousness in the face of the vicissitudes of life. And you can also read it as a, as a romance, you know, because to some degree, women who have to take care of infants do depend on men to confront the world and protect them. But it's very nicely read as a psychological story as well. And it's accurate. Now, back to the man who wrote me about his fantasies. The, 
the parts of his brain that are bringing mind, psyche, that are bringing those memories of being humiliated back are part of an alarm system. It's the same alarm system that tells you when something unexplored is dangerous. And if you're in a social situation and the consequence of being in this situation is that you're being humiliated and undermined, then obviously you haven't mapped out that situation very well. Now there might be all sorts of reasons and some of them might not be your fault, but it doesn't really matter as far as these alarm systems are concerned because all they're concerned about is the fact that you don't know what to do when you're in that situation and that's not good for you and you can't forget it. And the reason you can't forget it is, what if you're in that situation again? And so the alarm system says, well, what if you're in that situation again? What if you're in that situation again? What if you're in that situation again? And often traumatic memories are repetitive for people. They can't get them out of their minds and then they try to avoid them. And, and that just makes it worse because what you tell the alarm system when it rings the alarm, if you try to ignore it, is that the alarm is about something so terrifying that you won't even admit to the fact that there's an alarm. And so that just makes the alarm go off more. And so you try to avoid and, well, that doesn't work. That's something sort of akin to Freudian repression. And so what I recommended to this gentleman was that he write down all the times he was humiliated. It's like, so you've got these memories that won't let you go. You know, these people who took advantage of you. What happened exactly? That's hard to figure out, right? And maybe now he's a little smarter than he was in high school because maybe he's four years older. It's like, what exactly happened? Because the, the memory will be emotion-laden, but there's a lot of detail around it that's really relevant. You know, and, and one of the things you can do when you confront a memory like that, which is to confront the terrible things that happened to you in the past, which is the same as confronting terrible things per se, is you can ask yourself well, exactly what happened and what, exactly what part did I play, perhaps, and are there things that I could have done earlier or different, or is there some manner in which I set myself up for this? You know, and so I've had clients who were pretty seriously bullied at work, and we would go into it, and, you know, as I said, it starts with a few pushes and they don't respond, and then the pushes get a little harder, and they don't respond, the pushes get a little harder. And, and then it turns into something, well, maybe that's really, I mean, I had one client who was bullied into psychosis in, in high school. She was completely fractured by this person who decided to really do her in in a seriously malevolent way because she wouldn't go on a date with him. And uh, she had no idea that that kind of malevolence existed, and, so had been badly prepared in some sense to encounter someone like him. Now, if you're allowed to bump up against the rough edges of the world, the natural world and the social world, and if you have someone that you can communicate with, this, the probability is pretty high that you can learn incrementally how to map the world and your actions in it so that the probability that you're going to be pathologically prone to catastrophe and betrayal is much reduced. You know, so I'll tell you a story about my mother. So one day I was out playing baseball on a abandoned lot, empty lot, near my house, and my wife was there. We were only about eight or nine, ten, something like that. I was there with some of my friends. One of them was a tough little guy. I was little too, but not as tough. And uh, we were having an argument about something, and we were going to have a fight. And my mother walked by. And my mother is a pretty nice person, you know, and she had to learn late in life, to some degree, to stand up for herself when she went back into the workplace and had to confront some relatively intimidating and pushy men. And it was hard on her to do that, but she was no pushover, my mother, and she's a good person. 
And she walked by just as this fight was about to emerge. And I was not particularly confident of the probability of my uninjured victory in this fight. <laughs> but I was a hell of a lot more afraid that my mother was going to come over and interfere. And she didn't. But she knew what was happening. She looked. I saw her look. I knew she knew. She knew I knew. And she walked on. And it's like more power to her, you know. And because I was fortunate to have a mother like that, let's say, I got into enough of the sorts of scrapes that teach you how to avoid a certain amount of scrapes, and that worked out quite nicely. And that's meant my mother was willing to invite malevolence, invite the evil queen into my life, at least to some degree, you know, because she knew better than to assume that that could be just dispensed with. This program that so this guy that was having these fantasies, he said he's very afraid of the fantasies because they were murderous. And you think murderous fantasies. When do they emerge? Well, they definitely emerge when you've been pushed a hundred times and now you're past anything that vaguely resembles reason. And then the fantasy comes up as a manifestation of rage. So I asked him to write down what had happened and also to write down the fantasies. You know, what is it that you're, what reaction is it that you're having? Now, you'd hope that, it wasn't like he leapt from happy to murderous in one leap. He went through mildly irritated, extremely irritated, extremely humiliated, continually humiliated, repeatedly continually humiliated, and then, well, even a few years later, into murderous rage. And the problem with that is, is that he should have intervened a lot earlier. And so part of what he needed to learn by going back into that memory, which was now associated with those murderous fantasies, is that the aggression that was manifesting itself in the fantasies hadn't been manifested early enough in the process that led to his humiliation. And so then you can imagine, well, why didn't he react to being bullied in a way that would have stopped it? And the answer to that might be, well, he didn't have the skill, he didn't have the physical prowess, or perhaps he was overprotected. I don't know, because I didn't know the story. But it doesn't make any difference, because what he needed to figure out was how to take that response and differentiate it into something that was reasonably skilled so that the next time someone pulled a stunt that was like the stunts that led to his humiliation in high school, he was ready to act. And so you can think if a memory that you have that's old, well, or a problem that's bothering you right now that won't let you go, you can look at your fantasies because they'll often give you a clue as to what the appropriate response needs to be, not that that's necessarily the response you have to manifest, and then the trick is to implement the response in a manner that stops you from falling into the same hole that you fell in many times before. These stories that the psychologists' students wrote about their past traumas were curative because if they used words that indicated understanding, comprehension, etc., then they were remapping the territory that they hadn't mapped properly the first time they walked over it. And you're, you're, all of you is very much concerned with the st your stability and your, your safety from betrayal and malevolence and, and the probability, what? The, prob the probability, the, the necessity to avoid unnecessary tragedy. And so any past behavior that indicates that there's a hole in the map that you're using to orient yourself in the world lets all that terror shine through. And that's what the alarm is. And the reason it goes off is because it's saying to you, you have a map, 
it's got some bad holes, and the holes are places you probably are going to have to go again. And so if you go there again and the hole's still there, you're going to fall in the hole. And the last time you fell in the hole, it wasn't good for you, and so you should be alert to that. And so that's the reason that memories of that sort won't go away. It's actually a good thing, although it can be very bad if you don't know what to do about it. And it isn't merely a matter of expressing the emotion that's associated with the past catastrophe, because often that, not only does that not help, it can actually make it worse, because the mere expression of your frustration, let's say if you were bullied in high school, doesn't stop you perhaps from still being the sort of person that might be bullied by your co-workers. And that's not a positive outcome by any stretch of the imagination. So, this program we wrote, it's sort of like psychotherapy for free, essentially. It asks you to, and I, I used it on this client of mine who'd been bullied into a psychotic state when she was in high school. She could hardly even talk when she first came to see me and she was hallucinating in all sorts of strange ways. She was really badly fractured by this person who'd tortured her three quarters to death and we went through her whole life. Um, she could talk a little bit and she could write a little bit and I sat her behind my desk at my computer and we opened this program. And uh, what it does is it has you divide your life up into epochs, whatever you want. Maybe it's kindergarten, grade one to grade three, grade three to grade six. You know, you can do it numerically like that. You could do it by age. I had people who were more agreeable in temperament. They would divide their life up into relationships. That was really how they conceptualized the stages of their lives, each relationship. You know, it depends on you. It doesn't really matter, however you conceptualize your life. And then the exercise has you walk through and describe significant events, positive and negative, to lay them out and then to analyze them. It's like, well, what did you do right that enabled the positive events to occur? And what did you do that you might be able to alter or that you learned to alter later or that you could alter now that would help you avoid the negative events? So it's, it's not merely the recounting of the negative, it's in some sense, it's the extraction of the moral of the story. You know, there's this old idea, I'm sure you've heard me talk about it before, that dragons guard gold. It's a very strange idea, very old idea, treasure of one sort or another, that they threaten the city eternally. That's a dragon. And the city, in some sense, is the citadel of your memory. And the chaos that's outside of the citadel of your memory can always emerge to threaten the citadel, and that's the same story as the Garden of Eden and the snake. It's exactly the same idea. And if you confront the thing that threatens, then you can find the treasure. And you can use that to rebuild the citadel, but also to turn yourself into something that can confront the dragon. And that's the real treasure, right? Is to turn yourself into something that is, can and is willing to confront the dragon. And so, you know, I, do, I did a lot of work with people in my clinical practice on assertiveness therapy and uh, assertiveness training, and these are often for people who are very agreeable and they're more likely to be bullied. And uh, the reason for that is that they don't like conflict, but there's another reason too, which is that they don't have enough faith in the truth and enough fear of the consequences of not telling the truth and so they'll pretend that things are all right when they're not all right and then forestall catastrophe for later and so let's say your boss is kind of a bullying type and uh, pokes at you a bit takes advantage of you a little bit and you think well that's not really worth making a fuss about but you go home and you're kind of resentful and but you you don't pay any attention to that maybe you think you shouldn't be resentful but probably you don't think that. You just don't want to confront your boss. And the thing is, though, if you do it when, if it's on the first foray and you say, you know, here's the reason I won't do that, 
well, maybe you'll get fired, but probably not. Not if you're careful. Generally, someone like that will think, oh, you're not as easy to pick on as I thought you were, and they'll go find someone else, or maybe they'll even learn something from the encounter. You know, and then, and that takes a fair bit of courage, and that's part of that confrontation that we just described, you know, is that you're resentful because you've been taken advantage of, and you have something to say, and so you need to say it. And when I was doing assertiveness training with my clients, I often talked to them about their resentment. That would be the kind of resentment that might have someone generate murderous fantasies four years later. It's people who go out and do murderous things, you know, they've harbored an awful lot of resentment. There's a lot of things they didn't say when they should have said them, that's for sure. And so, you know, and if you let the people around you who you love hypothetically take advantage of you, then you're going to harbor resentment and that's going to come out in all sorts of ways that are really not positive in the least for you or for them. And so it's better just to have the, it's just better to draw the line when it, you know, when all there is of the dragon is one tooth. Say, no, here's why, leave me alone. Or here's how I want to be treated instead and insist upon that, right? You draw a line and it's not like that's nothing. And then I suggested to this man with murderous fantasies that he think about what he could have done different in high school, in principle, you know? Maybe he needed to get stronger so he was more confident. I'm not saying this is easy. That's irrelevant. Lots of things aren't easy that end in catastrophe. And the problem was that he was humiliated and now he's murderous and that's not a good outcome. So he, even if it's difficult, that doesn't mean it's unwarranted. But even more particularly in a situation like that, you ask, well, how did, how did you allow it to come to such a pass? And what could have you done differently? And maybe you might find that there wasn't anything that you could do differently back when you were in high school, but by the time you're in university, you're not in high school anymore, and the world's shifted quite a bit. And generally, you're around more sophisticated people, and that kind of bullying is less likely. And so you still might have some aggression to integrate within you so that you're not a pushover. And if you do that, well, then those memories in all likelihood are going to stop. As long as you're confident that now you know what to do, those memories are very likely to stop plaguing you and then hopefully those murderous fantasies will go away and you won't be inclined to act them out. <laughs>